Hello, hello everybody. How are you all? Hope you're doing well. Um, sometimes you need to make a decision to be in a better headspace than what you would have otherwise been. It's not just the world influencing us, because we can influence the world as well. There you go. Something to think about. Right, so what are we doing today? We finished our previous book. Our previous book was... Um, the second book in the Samiad series by Edith Nesbitt. There you go, I remembered, and I don't have the prompt sitting up on the top of my screen. Um, and we're about to start a new one by the la a lady called L. M. Montgomery, Lucy Maud Montgomery. And I probably won't remember her what her initials stand for next time, but that's okay. It doesn't matter. Anyway, so Lucy Maud Montgomery is very, very was a very, very famous for having written the Anne books. So that would be the ones that start with Anne of Green Gables. You might have heard of it. Um, or about as famous as Little Women by um, the other L. M. Lady. There you go, Louisa May Alcott. And I used to always get what their first names were mixed up, but uh, that's just the way it is. Um, so we're going to be reading Emily of New Moon. And those of you on Twitch will see the title and the picture of the cover up there in the my top in the top right hand corner of your screen. If you're watching this on YouTube, then it will be somewhere. I would have put it as part of the maybe eventually put it as part of a thumbnail for the video we'll see otherwise you can type in the title and the author's name and the f the phrase original cover or antique cover or anything like that into google and do an image search for it and you'll find it um so it's a picture of a girl standing there it looks like there's a little bit of a breeze pushing against her there's a, a hillside behind her with um wild grasses and flowers and also some trees off in the distance and she's holding her hands up like this and she's looking out at the view um and there's a reference to it um there's a caption on it in the book saying something about the green flash which you will find out what that means as we go into the story so I better pause for a minute, hit the pause button, there you go, pause button, not the recording pause button, but the talking to you pause button, and I'm just going to wait and see if my computer is going to stabilise itself, hopefully it will, I'm hoping some other things that are going on somewhere in the background on my computer are actually going to go away. I don't know what's going on with it at the moment. Yes, I'm back on the completely on the old computer, which means that I've got my browser open on my other monitor so I can keep an eye on some things that I need to keep an eye on. And it just means that every now and then its brain gets a little bit overwhelmed. And yes, I do need to get my replacement secondhand computer set up properly so I can stream from it because that will cope a lot better. It's much newer and it's got some much more powerful features about it. I, I would probably even be able to stream games from it as opposed to just reading and talking to the camera. Um, I haven't got any particular games that I'm, I would think to stream just because I don't have a gamer's re set of reflexes. I like games, but most of the games I like are puzzle sort of ones. Anyway, um, I was going to say something to the new visitors. So hi, if you're new, welcome. Thank you for being here. I hope you enjoy it. Um, I was a little bit embarrassed last night because um, hubby came home from from a get together with some other people that are uh, that was hosted by some good friends of ours, and said that he was in, he was there as their their guest to to share with these people from some experiences he's had. And he was introduced as being the husband of the famous me who reads books internationally or something like that. And I'm like, oh, my goodness. So if you're here from that intro, wonderful. Thank you for being here. Lovely to know that, that, that some of you have arrived. Um, and if you look at this on YouTube after I've actually finished doing the live session, 
that's great to, that you can enjoy the stories. Um, if, in case you're wondering, I am actually currently chatting to the people who are watching me reading, about to read live. Um, and if you wish to be part of that sort of thing, which is usually two weeks ahead of when the stories come up, the books come up on YouTube, then f look for, in my profile on YouTube, look for my link for Twitch and click on that link. And it's another website that has people playing games and doing all sorts of stuff or it's a live stream. YouTube does live streams too, but not quite the same way. Um, and then if you follow me there, you'll be able to, to know every time I actually go live and read. And then you can chat with me in the chat box and all that sort of stuff. One of the things that sometimes happens is that I will get stuck on a word. I probably know how to say it, but I may not be able to explain it well enough. And so I'll just throw it out to everybody to say, um, if you've got the time, if you've got the inclination, look it up for me and put it into the chat box and I'll read it out when I actually spot it. Um, and usually otherwise I just chat at the beginning and the end and then in the chapter breaks, which is what I'm currently doing. Um, what else? I'm Jev. I read old-fashioned children's stories, in case you hadn't realised that. Um, also, I have some tips. The tips are about being able to enjoy your story time. So have something to drink handy. For me, that means water. Uh, because it keeps me hydrated, it means it's easier to read because my throat doesn't get too dry. It's also great for your brain. If you're ever sort of like, oh, I've got to keep going, have another drink of water. Nothing in it, just water. Your body can take up the water a lot faster than it can if it's in something else like tea or coffee. And speaking of coffee, here's my, my treat for today is my homemade iced coffee, which is basically just... Um, a double shot espresso from the machine. Yeah, we've got a little desk, uh, bench top one that's that's not, not fabulous, but it does the job well because we know it. Um, just topped up with whole milk, so that means it hasn't been homogenised. It's nice and creamy. It's yummy. And it's cold milk, so it, it makes it uh, a nice cool drink, which at the moment in New Zealand is a good thing because we are... Yes, technically we're in autumn, but we still have a lot of summer warmth. And some of us find that a little bit much. Um, another tip um, is get yourself somewhere comfortable to sit or even lie down on the floor or something like that. I don't really care. I'm not going to be checking up on you. Honestly, I'm not. I'm not sending someone around to see if you're actually listening. I'm actually just going to read to you and it's up to you if you want to listen. If you want to study or do housework or some other sort of work while you're listening, that's all good by me. Uh, my, my, um, my streams and my videos are very, very um, amenable to people lurking because that's the way stories go. You sit there, you listen you try not to fidget in a way that's going to distract everybody else, especially me, the reader. I try not to fidget too much, but sometimes, you know, whatever. Um, but you listen. All the pictures are going on in your head instead of what you see on a screen in terms of a movie or a TV series or something like that. And your brain is drawing the story that you're, you're listening to. If you are someone who has the ability for... Um, words to create pictures in your head. There are some people who don't. And I'm, I I know it's real. I have a friend who has that situation with the way her brain functions. But I still haven't quite understood how that works for her. It's just, that's normal for her and it's not for me. That's just the way it is. Anyway, so somewhere comfortable sits great. Um... Pen and paper or a pencil and paper is handy in case there's something that you want to look up or find out more about later on. Uh, I didn't, and I shall, write up here. Write up here? No. I'm going to open. I was just talking about pen and paper, that's why I said write up. Um, I'm just going to open the Wikipedia article about our author or the book. Come on. Yeah, it's slow. My book, my, my book. Yes, my brain is slow. Just like my computer at the moment. <laughs> how, how very peculiar the whole thing is. Anyway, as a story reader, I would just like to point out that these are not audiobooks. 
I mean, it's audio because you're listening and it's from a book. Yes. Production values? Mm mm. Perfect pronunciation? Mm mm. Excellent accents? Mm mm. None of that stuff. I have the ability to get lost on the page that I am currently reading while I am reading it. I don't know if you can do that, but it's a special skill that I have. Uh, it's not deliberate, it just happens. No, that was not the page I wanted. Sorry. Sorry, I just thought that there was a Wikipedia article that would take me to first, and it hadn't. But now I've found it. Um, so I have this ability. I also have the ability to botch entirely any accent that I have. It's just another one of my special skills. <laughs> it makes it lots of fun. And I interrupt myself. So you might not be interrupting me the way a child would when they're having a story at bedtime. I interrupt myself. Um, sometimes I interrupt myself because I realise that there's something that I understand in the story that you may not, and I'll explain it for you. Um, sometimes it's because I've got some weird fact or an anecdote or a bit of life experience or something that actually connects with the story. And so for me, that sort of thing helps to make stories much more real, helps them to be grounded in the real world that the authors were writing from, even if they were writing about an imaginary place. And that's one of the treasures of old-fashioned stories is we get to experience an aspect of the world and history, the time period, that is different to where we currently are now. And it's all through those funny little black marks on the page. There you go. That's magic. Reading is magic, I reckon. Anyway, so we are about to get started. I'll give you a little bit of background first. Emily of New Moon is the first in a series of novels, and I am only going to be reading one of those. I'm only reading this one. I'm not reading the other two in the series, okay? Just because I have read them and I found them rather plodding, but... That could have been because of the age I was at the time, but I don't really want to, to spoil it for everybody else. If you really enjoy this and want to have a go at reading the sequels, you are most welcome to. And then to tell us all about it, you can go over to, you, uh, over to Discord and type in the chat over there. And Discord, there's a link for Discord on both my YouTube and my Twitch profile, so you'll be able to find that if you really, really want to. You might have to look a bit hard but it's another one of those free services. YouTube, Twitch, and Discord. Discord is kind of like old-fashioned bulletin boards. It's, it, it's a bit odd to find your way around initially because um, it's not quite as much like old-fashioned bulletin boards as people expect, but it's unlike a you, uh, Facebook page or group. It's easier to find bits of information in it because there are channels um, within my server, anybody's server, anyone who creates it. So a bulletin board that's on a particular theme in the old days was called a board and you'd have sub boards. These days you go over to Discord and you have your own channel. So I have a channel and that's the one where we talk about books very, very occasionally, not very often. We're very quiet like that. Uh, we're not very sociable people for some reason. I'm not quite sure why. Maybe it's because we're caught up in our books. Um, but within my Discord server, sorry, server, not channel, Discord has servers. Each server is like an original bulletin board that somebody would have on a particular thing. Now, then they would have sub boards. In Discord, I have a server. And then within my server, I have channels, and each channel has a different purpose, and the name of it will actually explain the purpose of it. Sometimes it was illustrations from a particular book, because a lot of the books that we've had so far have got illustrations in them. Not all of them that I've put the illustrations up yet. Um, some of them, it's a general channel for discussing what book that we maybe are going to, to, to read next, or some, some movie that was, that was our introduction to a particular book. We had a good old discussion about versions of a little princess. 
by Francis, Francis Hodgson Burnett. Just for an example. Anyway, so if you can go and join us over there. It's another free service. Um, right, and you don't have to do the nitro thing. That's a that's a way you pay a fee and, and you get these extras. But no, most people don't bother with it. It's not worth it. It just gives you a little wee thing by your name for most of us, um, which I don't do. So Emily of New Moon, I'm looking over here because this is where my other monitor is. If you're new here, you don't know that. But if you've been here for a while, you know. And it's like, oh, here we go again. Um, so Emily of New Moon is the first in a series of novels by Lucy Maud Montgomery about an orphan girl growing up on Prince Edward Island. Now, if you don't know where that is, that's in eastern Canada. Look it up on a map. Look it up on Google Maps. It's quite a large island, actually. Montgomery is also the author of the Anne of Green Gables series. This book, Emily of New Moon, was published in 1923. So it's a little bit newer than the last book we had, which was published in 1904. So there you go. Definitely in the public domain now. Uh, so it's 98 years old. No, 99 years old at the moment. There you go. Um, they depict... The, the, the Emily novels depict life through the eyes of a young orphan girl in a similar manner to the Anne books. Um, and in this one, the main character is Emily Bird Star. Bird, B-Y-R-D, and Star, S-T-A-R-R, -R, in case you're wondering. Um, and one of the in interesting things about the book, um, which... I didn't know when I started, when I read it the first time, but I found out afterwards, is actually that the book is based, has a lot of aspects of it that are based on the author's own life and experiences. So, one of those odd little things that you find out when you're reading books or reading books about books. There you go. How about we read? Yeah, good idea. Um, I've told you the different tips that you need. Sorry. I've got a little bit of hair floating around in front of me and it's distracting. Did I tell you I get distracted easily? I think I did. Or implied it when I was talking about being able to get lost in the page, in the middle of a sentence when I'm actually reading it. Yeah, that implies that I get distracted fairly easily. It's commonly known as ADHD. Mm. I don't have a diagnosis, but it's very definite that I have ADHD. Anyway, so here we go. We are about to read. Are you comfortable? Have you got your something to drink? If you hear vague clickings in the background, it's just because I'm doing something on my keyboard that I am I need to do at the moment. And with my mouse. The little clicks are my mouse. The funkier clicks are my keyboard. And one day I'll get a proper desk set up instead of this weird little wobbly thing. That squeaks sometimes. <laughs> anyway, so here we go. Emily of New Moon. Get comfortable. Um, they're not long, not as long as the last chapters we had. They're about half that length. So we'll be having at least two chapters today, I think. It's 20 past three. <sighs> I've been talking too long. Let's get on with reading. Emily of New Moon, chapter one. The House in the Hollow. The house in the hollow was, quote, a mile from anywhere, so Maywood people said. It was situated in a, little, in a grassy little dale, looking as if it had never been built like other houses, but had grown up there like a big brown mushroom. It was reached by a long green lane and almost hidden from view by the encircling growth of young birches. No other house could be seen from it, although the village was just over the hill. Sounds like a nice, peaceful sort of a location to me. Ellen Green had said it was the lonesomest place in the world and vowed that she wouldn't stay there a day if it wasn't that she pitied the child. So whoever Ellen Green is, I'm pretty sure we'll find that one out. Emily didn't know if she was being pitied and didn't know what lonesomeness meant. She had plenty of company. There was Father and Mike and Saucy Sal, S-A-L, Sal, the wind woman was always around, and there were the trees, Adam and Eve, and the rooster pine, and all the friendly lady birches. And there was the flash, too. She never knew when it might come, and the possibility of it kept her a thrill 
and expectant. Emily had slipped away in the chilly twilight for a walk. She remembered that walk very vividly all her life. Perhaps because of a certain eerie beauty that was in it. Perhaps because the flash came for the first time in weeks. More likely because of what happened after she came back from it. It had been a dull, cold day in early May, threatening to rain but never raining. Father had lain on the sitting room lounge all day. He had coughed a good deal, and he had not talked much to Emily, which was a very unusual thing for him. Most of the time he lay with his hands clasped under his head and his large, sunken, dark blue eyes fixed dreamily and unseeingly on the cloudy sky that was visible between the boughs of the two big spruces in the front yard. Adam and Eve, they always called those spruces. Because of a whimsical resemblance Emily had traced between their position, with reference to a small apple tree between them, and that of Adam and Eve and the Tree of Knowledge, in an old-fashioned picture in one of Ellen Green's books. The Tree of Knowledge looked exactly like the squat little apple tree, and Adam and Eve stood up on either side as stiffly and rigidly as did the spruces. Emily wondered what father was thinking of, but she never bothered him with questions when his cough was bad. She only wished she had somebody to talk to. Ellen Green didn't talk that day either. She did nothing but grunt. And grunts meant that Ellen was disturbed about something. She had grunted last night after the doctor had whispered to her in the kitchen, and she had grunted when she gave Emily a bedtime snack of bread and molasses. Emily did not like bread and molasses, but she ate it because she did not want to hurt Ellen's feelings. It was not often that Ellen allowed her anything to eat before going to bed, and when she did it meant that for some reason or other she wanted to confer a special favour. Emily expected the grunting attack would wear off overnight, as it generally did, but it had not, so no company was to be found, found in Ellen. Not that there was a great deal to be found at any time. Douglas Starr had once, in a fit of exasperation, told Emily that Ellen Green was a fat, lazy old thing of no importance. And Emily, whenever she looked at Ellen after that, thought the description fitted her to a hair. So Emily had curled herself up in the ragged, comfortable old wing chair and read The Pilgrim's Progress all the afternoon. Sorry, I'm just taking the lid off my water bottle with both hands because it's a bit hard to do with just one hand, and it's a squeaky thing, and I'm trying to make it not squeaky, so it doesn't disrupt as much, unlike me telling you what I'm doing, which disrupts it entirely. We'll carry on. Emily loved the Pilgrim's Progress. Many a time she had walked the straight and narrow path with Christian and Christiana, although she never liked Christiana's adventures half as well as Christian's. For one thing, there was always such a crowd with Christiana. She had not half the fascination of that solitary <coughs> she, being Christiana, had not half the fascination of that solitary intrepid figure who faced all alone the shadows of the dark valley and the encounter with Apollyon. Darkness and hobgoblins were nothing when you had plenty of company. But to be alone, ah, Emily shivered with the delicious horror of it. When Ellen announced that supper was ready, Douglas Starr told Emily to go out to it. I don't want anything tonight. I'll just lie here and rest. And when you come in again, we'll have a real talk, Elfkin. Obviously, that's his pet name for her. He smiled up at her, his old, beautiful smile with the love behind it. <coughs> Sorry. Tickle. Water. <coughs> Mm. Not the sort of cough that her father has, and not a COVID cough either, just one of those dry spot in your throat things <clears> that <throat> can itch and tickle for a while and make you talk funny. So, sorry about that. We'll get there. Right. <sighs> I'm just finding my place on the page. I warned you about this, didn't I? 
He smiled up at her his old, beautiful smile with the love behind it that Emily always found so sweet. She ate her supper quite happily, though it wasn't a good supper. The bread was soggy and her egg was underdone, but for a wonder she was allowed to have both saucy Sal and Mike sitting one on each side of her, and Ellen only grunted when Emily fed them wee bits of bread and butter. And this is where some of this author's skill comes in, because she tells you stuff when you need to know it, not before. A lot of people just give you lots of information when you don't yet need it. So I shall carry on reading, and you shall discover this for yourselves. Mike had such a cute way of sitting up on his haunches and catching the bits in his paws, and saucy Sal had her trick of touching Emily's ankle with an almost human touch when her turn was too long in coming. Emily loved them both, but Mike was her favourite. He was a handsome dark grey cat with huge owl-like eyes, and he was so soft and fat and fluffy. Sal was always thin. No amount of feeding put any flesh on her bones. Emily liked her but never cared to cuddle or stroke her because of her thinness. Yet there was a sort of weird beauty about her that appealed to Emily. She was grey and white, very white and very sleek, with a long pointed face, very long ears and very green eyes. She was a redoubtable fighter and strange cats were vanquished in one round. The fearless little spitfire would even attack dogs and rout them utterly. Emily loved her cats. She had brought them up herself, as she proudly said. They had been given to her when they were kittens by her sun Sunday school teacher because church attendance at that stage was very normal for everybody. So just accept that that's the way it was. Um, not everybody did, but in general, it was, it was quite a common thing. No need to be offended, just... Accept it. We'll carry on with the story. There'll be some aspects of the stories I read, if this is a, a point for the new people, um, that we don't necessarily agree with in this day and age. I'm not saying that I disagree with church going. I'm just saying that there are some things that each of us individually have disagreements with in the things that we read. But if you think about it in real life, even now, that happens. You read a news article, you don't necessarily agree with everything that the author believes, the author of that article. And it's up to you to use your mind, your brain, your ability to think things through to actually figure out what pieces you're going to really put a lot of store in, give a lot of strength to, and which pieces you're just going to lightly brush over and think that that's just part of that, the way that person thinks. And we can do the same with anything that we read. We have the choice. We do not have to accept wholesale absolutely everything we read because a lot of what we read will contradict other things that we read. So there you go. You have to make up your own mind. So that also applies when you're reading an older book that has different social attitudes to what you now currently live with. So what was acceptable in one time period is not acceptable in another time period such as our own. Attitudes to women in a lot of older books is not what it is now. Um, attitudes to people who have disabilities is not, was not what it is now. Some things are at, were actually better in attitudes than what they are now, and a lot of things were worse back then. So we can learn from all those things. That's why we read them, we find out about stuff, and we can think for ourselves, and it expands our minds. So I'll carry on reading instead of having a go at you about it. But yeah, it's okay to hear things that you don't necessarily agree with. It's good for the mind. Anyway, they had been given to her when they were kittens by her Sunday school teacher. A living present is so nice, she told Ellen, because it keeps on getting nicer all the time. But she worried considerably because saucy Sal didn't have kittens. I don't know why she doesn't, she complained to Ellen Green. Most cats seem to have more kittens than they know what to do with. After supper, Emily went in and found that her father had fallen asleep, in and out being the room that he's based in, obviously. She was very glad of this. She knew he had not slept much for two nights, but she was a little disappointed that they were not going to have that real talk. Real talks with father were always such delightful things, but the next best would be a walk, a lovely, all-by-your-lonesome walk 
through the grey evening of the young spring. It was so long since she had had a walk. You put on your hood and mind you scoot back if it starts to rain, warned Ellen. You can't monkey with colds the way some kids can. Why can't I? Emily asked rather indignantly. Why must she be debarred from monkeying with colds if other children could? It wasn't fair. But Ellen only grunted. Emily muttered under her breath for her own satisfaction. You are a fat old thing of no importance. <laughs> She's being a little bit rebellious there, isn't she? she? And slipped upstairs to get her hood, rather reluctantly, for she loved to run bareheaded. But she put the faded blue hood on over her long, heavy braid of glossy jet black hair and smiled chummily at her reflection in the little greenish glass. Chummily, in a friendly way, like she's mates with them reflection. The smile began at the corners of her lips and spread over her face in a slow, subtle, very wonderful way. As Douglas Starr often thought, it was her dead mother's smile, the thing that had caught and held him long ago when he had first seen Juliet Murray. It seemed to be Emily's only physical inheritance from her mother. In all else, he thought, she was like the stars in her large, purplish-grey eyes with their very long lashes and black brows in her high white forehead, too high for beauty, in the delicate modelling of her pale oval face and sensitive mouth, in the little ears that were pointed just a wee bit to show that she was kin to tribes of Elfland. "'I'm going for a walk with the wind woman, dear,' said Emily. "'I wish I could take you too. "'Do you ever get out of that room, I wonder?' The wind woman is going to be out in the fields tonight. She is tall and misty with thin grey, silky clothes blowing all about her and wings like a bat's, only you can see through them, and shining eyes like stars, looking through her long, loose hair. She can fly, but tonight she will walk with me all over the fields. She is a great friend of mine, the wind woman is. I've known her ever since I was six. We're old, old friends, but not quite so old as you and I, little Emily in the glass. We've been friends always, haven't we? With a blown kiss to little Emily in the glass, Emily out of the glass was off. The wind woman was waiting for her outside, ruffling the little spears of striped glass, grass, little spears of striped grass that was sticking up stiffly in the bed under the sitting-room window, tossing the big boughs of Adam and Eve, whispering among the misty green branches of the birches, teasing the rooster pine, the rooster pine behind the house. It really did look like an enormous, ridiculous rooster with a huge bunchy tail and a head thrown back to crow. I'm, I'm guessing it has two main branches, one that goes upwards and one that sort of like had a bit of an accident and went bendy like a, uh, a rooster tail. <coughs> Sorry, more things to do with the fact that I had that weird cough before. <coughs> <coughs> right, carrying on. <sighs> it was so long since Emily had been out for a walk that she was half crazy with the joy of it. The winter had been so stormy and the snow so deep that she was never allowed out. April had been a month of wind, rain and wind, so on this May evening she felt like a released prisoner. Where should she go? Down the brook or over the fields to the spruce barrens? Emily chose the latter. She loved the spruce barrens, away at the further end of the long, sloping pasture. That was a place where magic was made. She came more fully into her fairy birthright there than in any other place. Nobody who saw Emily skimming over the bare field would have envied her. She was little and pale and poorly clad. Sometimes she shivered in her thin jacket, yet a queen might have gladly given a crown for her visions, her dreams of wonder. The brown frosted grasses under her feet were velvet piles, the old mossy gnarled half-dead spruce tree under which she paused for a moment to look up into the sky was a marble column in a palace of the gods. 
the far dusky hills were the ramparts of a city of wonder, and for companions she had all the fairies of the countryside, for she could believe in them here. The fairies of the white clover and satin catkins, the little green folk of the grass, the elves of the young fir trees, sprites of wind and wild fern and thistledown, anything might happen there, everything might come true. And the barrens were such a splendid place in which to play hide and seek with the wind woman, she was very real there. If you could just spring quietly enough round a little cluster of spruces, only you never could, you would see her as well as feel her and hear her, hear her. There she was, that was the sweep of her grey cloak, no? She was laughing up at the very top of the taller trees, and the chase was on again, till all at once it seemed as if the wind woman were gone. And the evening was bathed in a wonderful silence, and there was a sudden rift in the, cur in the curdled clouds westwards, and a lovely pale pinky green lake of sky with a new moon in it. Emily stood and looked at it with clasped hands and her little black head upturned. She must go home and write down a description of it in the yellow account book where, where the last thing written had been Mike's biography. B-I-O-G-R-A-F-F-Y. Mike's biography. It would hurt her with its beauty until she wrote it down. Then she would read it to father. She must not forget how the tips of the trees on the hill came out like fine black lace across the edge of the pinky green sky. And then for one glorious supreme moment came the flash. Emily called it that, although she felt that the name didn't exactly describe it. It couldn't be described, not even to father, who always seemed a little puzzled by it. Emily never spoke of it to anyone else. It had always seemed to Emily, ever since she could remember, that she was very, very near to a world of wonderful beauty. Between it and herself hung only a thin curtain. She could never draw the curtain aside, but sometimes just for a moment. A wind fluttered it, and then it was as if she caught a glimpse of the enchanting realm beyond, only a glimpse, and heard a note of unearthly music. This moment came rarely, went swiftly, leaving her breathless with the inexpressible delight of it. She could never recall it, never summon it, never pretend it. But the wonder of it stayed with her for days. It never came twice with the same thing. Tonight the dark boughs against that far-off sky had given it. It had come with a high, wild note of wind in the night, with a shadow wave over a ripe, over a, with a shadow wave over a ripe field, with a grey bird lighting on her window sill in a storm, with the singing of holy, holy, holy church, in church, with a glimpse of the kitchen fire when she had come home on a dark autumn night with the spirit-like blue of ice palms on a twi twilight pane, that's the, um, from the frost, the frost patterns on the glass, with a felicitous new word when she was writing down a description of something, and always when the flash came to her, Emily felt that life was a wonderful, mysterious thing of persistent beauty. She scuttled back to the house in the hollow, through the gathering twilight, all agog to get home and write down her description before the memory picture of what she had seen grew a little blurred. She knew just how she would begin it. The sentence seemed to shape itself in her mind. The hill called to me, and something in me called back to it. She found Ellen Green waiting for her on the sunken front doorstep. Emily was so full of happiness that she loved everything at that moment, even fat things of no importance. She flung her arms around Ellen's knees and hugged them. Ellen looked down gloomily into the rapt little face, where excitement had kindled a faint wild rose flush, and said with a ponderous sigh, Do you know that your pa has only a week or two more to live? And that's the end of the first chapter. Oh dear, that's not good news, is it? I wondered when it made reference to him having hollow eyes, um, not getting out for a walk, 
his cough. I wonder what it is. I wonder if they will explain to us in the story what it is that he's sick with. What a horrible thing to have to tell her. Poor Ellen. Even if she is an unimaginative type of person, that is a hard thing to have to do. Oh dear. So hard. Anyway. Shall we carry on and find out what happens next? I think this chapter's a little longer, so we will not be an hour today. We will probably be an hour and a half. Don't panic. We'll get there. And hopefully there'll be a little bit more something uplifting after that last sentence there. That was not particularly encouraging, was it? Anyway, let's read the story. Emily of New Moon by L. M. Montgomery Chapter 2 A Watch in the Night Emily stood quite still and looked up at Ellen's broad red face. As still as if she had been suddenly turned to stone. She felt as if she had. She was as stunned as if Ellen had struck her a physical blow. The colour faded out of her little face and her pupils dilated until they swallowed up the irises and turned her eyes into pools of blackness. The effect was so startling that even Ellen Green felt uncomfortable. Unimaginative Ellen Green. I'm telling you this because I think it's high time you was told, she said. I've been at your pa for months to tell you, but he's kept putting it off and off. I says to him, says I, you know how hard she takes things, and if you drop off sudden some day, it'll most kill her if she hasn't been prepared. It's your duty to prepare her, and he says, says he, there's time enough yet, Ellen, but he's never said a word, and when the doctor told me last night that the end might come any day now, I just made up my mind that I'd do what was right and drop a hint to prepare you. Laws a massy, miss child. Laws a massy, child. Don't look like that. You'll be looked after. Your ma's people will see to that on account of the Murray pride. If for no other reason, they won't let one of their own blood starve or go to strangers, even if they have always hated your pa like poison. You'll have a good home, better than you'd have ever have, ha better than you ever had here. You needn't worry a mite, for your as for your pa, you ought to be thankful to see him at rest. He's been dying by inches for the last five years. He's kept it from you, but he's been a great sufferer. Folks say his heart broke when your ma died. It came on him so sudden-like. She was only sick three days. That's why I want you to know what's coming. So's you won't be all upset when it happens. For mercy's sake, Emily Bird Star, don't stand there staring like that. You give me the creeps. You ain't the first child that's been left an orphan, and you won't be the last. Try and be sensible. And don't go pestering your pa about what I've told you. Mind that. Come you in now, out of the damp, and I'll give you a cookie before you go to bed. Ellen stepped down as if to take the child's hand. The power of motion returned to Emily. She must scream if Ellen even touched her now. With one sudden, sharp, bitter little cry, she avoided Ellen's hand, darted through the door and fled up the dark staircase. Ellen shook her head and waddled back to her kitchen. Anyhow, I've done my duty, she reflected. He'd have just kept saying time enough and put it off till he was dead, and then there'd have been no managing her. She'll have to take time now to get used to it, and she'll brace up in a day or two. I'll say for her she's got spunk, which is lucky from all I've heard of the Murrays. They won't find it easy to overcrow her. She's got a streak of their pride too, and that'll help her through. I wish I did send some of the Murray's word that he's dying, but I don't dast go that far. There's no telling what he'll, he'd do. Well, I've stuck on here to the last, and I ain't sorry. Not many women would have done it, living as they do here. It's a shame the way that child's been brought up. Never sent, even sent to school. Well, I've told him often enough what I've thought of it. It ain't on my conscience, that's one comfort. Here you, Southing. You get out. Where's Mike? 
too. Ellen could not find Mike for the very good reason that he was upstairs with Emily, held tightly in her arms as she sat in the darkness on her little cot bed. Oh, yeah, my accents. I can't do accents. I just try to make it sound different from the main character, that's all. Um, and as supposedly Ellen is a working person, technically of a more working class, I suppose you would say, back in those days, she doesn't have refined vowels. She possibly drops letters when she speaks. Doesn't matter. It's just so you can follow who's talking. That's really all it's about. And by the way, these people would have had um, Prince Edward Island Canadian accents, which I'm not going to go near. Something from the British Isles is a lot more likely for me. I don't do North American accents. Sorry. Unsustainable. I can give you maybe one word, two words, and that's about it. And it's definitely not any particular accent from North America. It's just got extra R's in it. Anyway, we'll carry on with our story. Hopefully, we'll get somewhere with it and end on a slightly more positive note. I do know that I really enjoyed the story. It was quite an emotional roller coaster. It will be that. But it's a nicely written story too. And it's written by an author that lots of people know of, but they haven't necessarily come across this particular book. So we'll carry on. Amid her agony and desolation, there was a certain comfort in the feel of his soft fur and round, velvety head. This is Mike the cat. Emily was not crying. She stared straight into the darkness, trying to face the awful thing Ellen had told her. She did not doubt it. Something told her it was true. Why couldn't she die too? She couldn't go on living without father. If I was God, I wouldn't let things like this happen, she said. She felt it was very wicked of her to say such a thing. Ellen had once told her that it was the wickedest thing anyone could do to find fault with God. But she didn't care. Sorry, I've got something itching in my eye. Probably an eyelash. The wickedest thing that she could do was to find fault, fault with God, according to Ellen. But Emily doesn't care. Perhaps if she were wicked enough, God would strike her dead and then she and father could keep on being together. That sounds like a child's logic. But nothing happened. Only Mike got tired of being held so tightly and squirmed away. She was all alone now with this burning pain, terrible burning pain, that seemed all over her and yet was not of the body. She could never get rid of it. She couldn't help it by writing about it in the old yellow account book. She had written there about her Sunday school teacher going away and of being hungry when she went to bed and Ellen t telling her that she must be half crazy to talk of wind women and flashes. And after she had written down all these, uh, ab all about them, these things didn't hurt her any more. But this couldn't be written about. She could not even go to father for comfort, as she had gone when she burned her hand so badly picking up the red-hot poker by mistake. Father had held her in his arms all that night and told her stories and helped her to bear the pain. But father, so Ellen had said, was going to die in a week or two. Emily felt as if Ellen had told her this years and years ago. It surely couldn't be less than an hour since she had been playing with the wind woman and the barons and looking at the new moon in the pinky green sky, the flash will never come again. It can't, she thought. But Emily had inherited certain things from her fine old ancestors. The power to fight, to suffer, to pity, to love very deeply, to rejoice, to endure. These things were all in her and looked out at you through her purplish grey eyes. Her heritage of endurance came to her aid now and bore her up. She must not let father know what Ellen had told her, it might hurt him. She must keep it all to herself and love father. Oh, so much in the little while she could yet have him. She heard him cough in the room below. She must be in bed when he came up. She undressed as swiftly as her cold fingers permitted and crept into the little cot bed which stood across the open window. 
Voices of the gentle spring night called to her all unheeded, unheard, the wind woman whistling by the eaves. For the fairies dwell only in the kingdom of happiness. Having no souls, they cannot enter the kingdom of sorrow. She lay there cold and tearless and motionless when her father came into the room. How very slowly he walked. How very slowly he took off his clothes. How was it she had never noticed these things before? But he was not cough coughing at all. Oh, what if Ellen were mistaken? What if a wild hope shot through her aching heart? She gave a little gasp. Douglas Starr came over to her bed. She felt his dear nearness as he sat down on the chair beside her in his old dressing, old red dressing gown. Oh, how she loved him. There was no other father like him in all the world. There never could have been so tender, so understanding, so wonderful. They had always been such chums. They had loved each other so much. It couldn't be that they were to be separated. Winkums, are you asleep? No, whispered Emily. Are you sleepy, small dear? No, no, I'm not sleepy. Douglas Starr took her hand and held it tightly. Then we'll have our talk, honey. I can't sleep either. I want to tell you something. Oh, I know it, I know it, burst out Emily. Oh, father, I know it, Ellen told me. Douglas Starr was silent for a moment. Then he said under his breath, the old fool, the fat old fool, as if Ellen's fatness was an added aggravation of her folly. Again, for the last time, Emily hoped. Perhaps it was all a dreadful mistake, just some more of Ellen's fat foolishness. It... It isn't true, is it, father? she whispered. Emily, child, said her father, I can't lift you up. I haven't the strength. But climb up and sit on my knee, in the old way. She slipped out of bed and got on her father's knee. He wrapped the old dressing gown about her and held her close with his face against hers. Don't forget it's cold and the window's open. Emily, uh, no, got that bit. Dear little child, little beloved Emily Kim, it is quite true, he said. I meant to tell you myself tonight, and now that old absurdity of an Ellen has told you. Brutally, I suppose, and hurt you dreadfully. She has the brain of a hen and the sensibility of a cow. May Jackal sit on her grandmother's grave. I wouldn't have hurt you, dear. Emily fought down something that wanted to choke her. You know that lump in your throat? Father, I can't, I can't bear it. Yes, you can and will. You will live because there is something for you to do, I think. You have my gift along with something I never had. You will succeed where I failed, Emily. I haven't been able to do much for you, sweetheart, but I've done what I could. I've taught you something, I think, in spite of Ellen Green. Emily, do you remember your mother? Just a little, here and there, li like lovely bits of dreams. You were only four when she died. I've never talked much to you about her. I couldn't, but I'm going to tell you all about her tonight. It doesn't hurt me to talk of her now. I'll see her so soon again. You don't look like her, Emily, only when you smile. For the rest, you're like your namesake, my mother. When you were born, I wanted to call you Juliet, too, but your mother wouldn't. She said if we called you Juliet, then I'd soon take to calling her Mother to distinguish between you, and she couldn't endure that. She, she called her Aunt Nancy. She said her Aunt Nancy had once said to her, the first time your husband calls you Mother, the romance of life is over. So we called you after my mother. Her maiden name was Emily Byrd, B-Y-R-D. Your mother thought Emily the prettiest name in the world. It was quaint and arch and delightful, she said. Emily, your mother was the sweetest woman ever made. I shall carry on in a moment. Now, if you're in chat and you want to, please look up the word arch for an archaic usage. It's obviously not a structural thing. Arch, 
the word quaint, arch and delightful, that context. You'll find it, you might have to dig a little, but if you find it, please put it into the chat and I'll read it out to everybody so that you understand the use of it in this context. You kind of get the idea, but it's better if you have a proper... Um, ex sorry, I'm just being distracted by a piece of hair that's waving around alongside my face, I think. Yeah, I'm pretty sure. Sorry, I just... There it is. It's actually on my glasses frame, which is why I hadn't been able to move it, because I wasn't touching my glasses frame. Time for a drink, time for a snack. Mmm, yum. It was quaint and arch and delightful, she said. Emily, your mother was the sweetest woman ever made. His voice trembled and Emily snuggled close. I met her 12 years ago when I was sub-editor of the Enterprise up in Charlottetown and she was in her last year at Queen's. So Charlottetown, I think, is a real place on Prince Edward Island. I'm not certain. Um, Queen's is a university and I'm not sure, but it may have been a women's university. Have a look. Those will possibly be real places. She was tall and fair and blue-eyed. She looked a little like your Aunt Laura, but Laura was never so pretty. You can see that they were not they don't look at all alike, tall and fair. Although they do both have blue eyes. Different coloured blue, I think. Their eyes were very much alike, the two sisters, and their voices. She was one of the Murrays from Blair Water. I've never told you much about your mother's people, Emily. They live up on the old North Shore at Blair Water, on New Moon Farm. Always have lived there since the first Murray came out from the old country in 1790. The ship he came on was called the New Moon, and he named his farm after her. It's a nice name. The New Moon is such a pretty thing, said Emily, interested for a moment. There has been a Murray ever since at New Moon Farm. They're a proud family, the Murray. Uh, the Murray pride is a byword along the North Shore, Emily. Well, they had some things to be proud of. That cannot be denied. But they carried it too far. Folks call them the chosen people up there. They increased and multiplied and scattered all over, but the old stock at New Moon Farm is pretty well run out. Only your aunts... Elizabeth and Laura live there now, and their cousin, Jim Murray. They never married, could not find anyone good enough for a Murray, so it used to be said. Your Uncle Oliver and your Uncle Wallace live in Summerside, your Aunt Ruth in Shrewsbury, and your Great Aunt Nancy at Priest Pond. Priest Pond, that's an interesting name. Not a pretty name like New Moon and Blair Water, but interesting, said Emily. Feeling father's arm around her, the horror had momentarily shrunk away. For just a little while, she ceased to believe it. Douglas Starr tucked the dressing gown a little more closely around her, kissed her black head, and went on. Elizabeth and Laura, and Wallace, and Oliver, and Ruth were old Archibald Murray's children. His first wife was their mother. When he was 60, he married again, a young slip of a girl who died when your mother was born. Juliet was 20 years younger than her half-family, as she used to call them. She was very pretty and charming, and they all loved and petted her and were very proud of her. When she fell in love with me, a poor young journalist, with nothing in the world but his pen and his ambition, there was a family earthquake. The Murray pride couldn't tolerate the thing at all. I won't rake it up, but things were said that I could never forget or forgive. Your mother married me, Emily, and the New Moon people would have nothing more to do with her. Can you believe that? In spite of it, she was never sorry for marrying me. Can you believe that in spite of it, she was never sorry for marrying me? Both uses of the sentence work. Emily put her hand, put up her hand and patted her father's hollow cheek. 
Of course she wouldn't be sorry. Of course she'd rather have you than all the Murrays of any kind of a moon. Father laughed a little, and there was just a note of triumph in his laugh. Yes, she seemed to feel that way about it, and we were so happy. Oh, Emilykin, there, there never were two happier people in the world. You were the child of that happiness. I remember the night you were born in the little house in Charlottetown. It was in May, and a west wind was blowing silvery clouds over the moon. There was a star or two here and there. In our tiny garden, everything we had was small except our love and our happiness. It was dark and blossomy. I walked up and down the path between the beds of violets your mother had planted and prayed. The pale east was just beginning to glow like a rosy pearl when someone came and told me. I had a little daughter. I went in and your mother, white and weak, smiled just that dear, slow, wonderful smile I loved and said, we've got the only baby of any importance in the world, dear. Just think of that. I wish people could remember from the very moment they were born, said Emily. It would be so very interesting. I dare say we'd have a lot of uncomfortable memories, said her father, laughing a little. It can't be very pleasant getting used to living, no pleasanter than getting used to stopping it. But you didn't seem to find it hard, for you were a good wee kidlet, Emily. We had four more happy years, and then, do you remember the time your mother died, Emily? I remember the funeral, father. I remember it distinctly. You were standing in the middle of a room, holding me in your arms, and mother was lying just before us in a long black box, and you were crying, and I couldn't think why, and I wondered why mother looked so white and wouldn't open her eyes. And I leaned down and touched her cheek, and, oh, it was so cold. It made me shiver, and somebody in the room said, poor little thing, and I was frightened and put my face down on your shoulder. Yes, I recall that. Your mother died very suddenly. I don't think we'll talk about it. I think it's a bit much for father in his current state. The Murrays have... No, no. I don't think we'll talk about it. The Murrays all came to her funeral. The Murrays have certain traditions, and they live up to them very strictly. One of them is that nothing but candles shall be burned for light at new moon, and another is that no quarrel must be carried past the grave. They came when she was dead. They would have come when she was ill if they had known. I will say that much for them. And they behaved very well, oh, very well indeed. They were not the Murrays of new moon for nothing. Your Aunt Elizabeth wrote her, wore her best black satin dress to the funeral. For any funeral but a Murray's, the second best one would have done. And they made no serious objection when I said your mother would be buried in the star plot in Charlottetown Cemetery. They would have liked to take her back to the old Murray burying ground in Blair Water. They had their own private burying ground, you know. No indiscriminate graveyard for them, but your Uncle Wallace handsomely admitted that a woman should belong to her husband's family in life, death as in life. And they offered to take you and bring you up, to give you your mother's place, so to speak. I refused to let them have you then. Did I do right, Emily? Yes, 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 whispered Emily with a hug at every yes. I told Oliver Murray, it was he who spoke to me about you, that as long as I lived, I would not be parted from my child. He said, if you ever change your mind, let us know. But I did not change my mind, not even three years later when my doctor told me, I must give up work. If you don't, I'll give you a year, he said. If you do and live out of doors all you can, I give you three or possibly four. He was a good prophet. I came out here and we have had four lovely years together. 
haven't we, small dear one? Yes, oh yes, those years and what I've taught you in them are the only legacy I can leave you, Emily. We've been living on a tiny income I have from a life interest that was left me in an old uncle's estate. An uncle who died before I was married. The estate goes to a charity now and this little house is only a rented one. From a worldly point of view, I have certainly been a failure. But your mother's people will care for you. I know that. The Murray pride will guarantee you so much. Will guarantee so much, if nothing else. And they can't help loving you. Perhaps I should have sent for them before. Perhaps I ought to do it yet. But I have a pride of a kind too. The stars are not entirely traditionless. And the Murrays said some very bitter things to me when I married your mother. Will I send to New Moon and ask them to come, Emily? No, said Emily, almost fiercely. She did not want anyone to come between her and father for the few precious days left. The thought was horrible to her. It would be bad enough if they had to come afterwards, but she would not mind anything much then. We'll stay together to the very end then, little Emily child. We won't be parted for a minute, and I want you to be brave. You mustn't be afraid of anything. Emily, death isn't terrible. The universe is full of love, and spring comes everywhere. And in death you open and shut a door. There are beautiful things on the other side of the door. I'll find your mother there. I've doubted many things, but I've never doubted that. Sometimes I've been afraid that she would get so far ahead of me in the ways of eternity that I'd never catch up. But I feel now that she's waiting for me, and we'll wait for you. We won't hurry. We'll loiter and linger till you catch up with us. I wish you could take me right through the door with you, whispered Emily. After a little while you won't wish that. You have yet to learn how kind time is. And life has something for you. I feel it. Go forward to meet it fearlessly. I know you don't feel like that just now, dear, but you will remember my words by and by. I feel just now, said Emily, who couldn't bear to hide anything from father, that I don't like God any more. Douglas Starr laughed, the laugh Emily liked best. It was such a clear laugh. She caught her breath over the dearness of it. She felt his arms tightening around her. Yes, you do, honey. You can't help liking God. He is love itself, you know. You mustn't mix him up with Ellen Green's God, of course. Emily didn't know exactly what father meant, but all at once she found that she wasn't afraid any longer and the bitterness had gone out of her sorrow and the unbearable pain out of her heart. She felt as if love was all about her and around her, breathed out from some great invisible hovering tenderness. One couldn't be afraid or bitter where love was, and love was everywhere. Father was going through the door. No, he was going to lift a curtain. She liked that thought better, because a curtain wasn't as hard and fast as a door, and he would slip into that world of which the flash had given her glimpses. He would be there in its beauty, never very far away from her. She could bear anything if she could only feel that father wasn't very far away from her, just beyond that wavering curtain. Douglas Starr held her until she fell asleep. And then, in spite of his weakness, he managed to lay her down in her little bed. Sorry. She will love deeply. She will suffer terribly. She will have glorious moments to compensate, as I have had. As her mother's people deal with her, so may God deal with them, he murmured brokenly. And that's the end of our chapter. End of today's reading.
Ooh, what do you think? Such an intense start to our book. I'm so glad I didn't stop after the first chapter. <laughs> I mean, yes, it's still sad and it's downhill and all that sort of stuff. But you don't have a, um, a, a compelling story if there isn't something you have to overcome or work through, some tension to the story. And trust me, this story will have more tension than just her father and his passing. So what do you think? We're going to carry on reading it regardless of what you think. So there. <laughs> Sorry, I'm a bit mean that way. Once I've decided on a story, we're reading it. I did have one book that I was wondering partway through if I was just going to stop because it was a whole lot of poems. And I don't think I'm a very poemy sort of a person. Although I must admit to enjoying reading the poems in the Alice books, the Alice in Wonderland and Through the Looking Glass books. Do you remember the Jabberwock? Beware the Jabberwock, my son. Blah, blah, blah. I had somebody ask me, if, uh, say to me that they could tell that I knew the poem and that I was enjoying it just because of the way I read it. Anyway, so... There you go. So your task between now and two days' time when I read the, do the next reading of chapters is to find on a map where Prince Edward Island is in Canada. Its um, code is P-E-I, Prince Edward Island. Um, it's kind of rounded banana shaped rounded because it's it, it's banana shaped but it's got more rounded ends on it and it's got some other shapes to it but that's vaguely what it's like and it's in the eastern part of Canada it's I think from what I understand it was at the time of the writing it was a very rural place they had a town they had towns uh, I don't think they had what we would call a city um, it may, they may have considered it to be a city and yes that that um Queen's University or Queen's College was a real place. It's still there, but it's been incorporated into their, I think they call it their regional or state university, which has a different name. It's part of that now, and I think they actually still have some of those buildings from it there. I think that's where the new, newer, bigger university was developed around it, but I'm not sure. So go and find out. And then join our Discord server and tell us all about it. Tell us what you found out. All those wonderful things. Um, what else? So there was Prince Edward Island, Queen's University, maybe some of those places. What were they called again? Let's have a look. Just have a quick look back in the story and see what the names of some of those places were. I think that a bunch of them are going to be... Um, imaginary places but there are other ones that are possibly real so that he talked about the north shore when you look at the map you will probably figure out where the north shore is um blair water b-l-a-i-r i don't know if that's real or not you can look that one up are you writing it down so you know to look it up uh blair water um and what was it, Charlotte Town or something like that? Charlotte Town. I would think that Charlotte Town is a real place. Charlotte Town, but written as one word. Do you need me to spell Charlotte? Are you ready? Pencil in hand, sharp enough to write with, or your phone. C H A R. L O T T E T O W N. There you go. Ha! <sighs> look at them all up. It's it's actually really interesting to look up places and people, such as authors, finding finding out where they may have lived, because often when they write about a place with intensity. It's because it's a place that they have a sense of connection with. Um, um, <clears throat> it's not usually entirely in their imagination, unless it's a fantasy. Uh, but most other stories 
if you have a story set somewhere that uses a real place's name and something like a description of what it's like, um, it's because there's a sense of connection that the author has with that, with that town, village, island, state, country, region, whatever. Um, and it, they bring threads of their knowing of the place, the feel of it, some of the things that they saw there or nearby. They use that to bring realism to the way they write. And uh, there's, there's a lot of authors that, that just write vague descriptions of things. And then you have some authors that will give you details without giving you too much details, enough that your mind will draw it for you. Now, it will look different to the real thing, obviously, um, unless you've been there. Um, but the way they describe it helps you to visualize it in a way that makes the story feel more real. And so you connect with the people in the story, especially the, the principal character. There's usually one main character that you follow in a story. And that's one of the reasons why reading is very, very good for mental and emotional health. Did you know that? Reading is very, very good for your mental health and your emotional health because it helps you to get inside someone else's skin and understand them to a certain extent, to understand somebody as if it was you, but somebody who has completely different points of view on things to what you do, who has different life experiences, even if they are fictional. And that all stretches, it stretches our imagination, yes, but it also stretches our ability to then understand that other people around us actually have different points of view to us, have different ways of looking at the world to us, and that those are valid. They're different to ours. We may not agree with them, but those are still valid points of view because it is a reflection of who they are and the experiences and the life that they have lived. You are a result of the life that you've lived up till now. I am a result. The the attitudes and the... And the um, Projections I have are a result of the life I have lived up to now, the experiences I've had up to now, the same with everybody else. So we can extend an understanding to somebody else. We can, even if we don't actually know the details, we can still actually go, oh, that's probably actually, even if I don't agree with that, that's probably actually a valid opinion for, because of something that they have experienced in their own life or the way they were brought up or something like that. We don't have to agree with it. But we can understand that they have their own reasoning behind it. And that's good for your health. It's good for your brain. It's good for your heart. It's good for other people around you. you just got to put it into practice. Yeah. Anyway, so I'm going to give you the links just in case you can't be bothered to look them up. So YouTube. Yes, it worked. Sorry, I was just waiting for the, the bot to put it in there for me because I couldn't remember if I'd spell I couldn't tell if I had spelt it right sometimes I can see spelling mistakes easily and sometimes I can't do you have that and the other one is discord which is like I said a modern version of bulletin boards and it's a much easier way to be able to find different aspects of conversations and stuff like that than say something like Facebook Facebook's a bit strange it shows you stuff that's really old as if it's brand new and then it won't show you something that somebody's just posted in in the group. And even some unless it's actually something that it gave you a notification of, it, it's like, oh, here, have a look at something that's three days old. And I know jolly well somebody else has actually put something in more recently than that. I don't know. It's weird. So Discord's different to that. It's much more like bulletin boards. You'll find your way around. Initially, it's a bit harder, but you will find your way around once you've got the hang of it. And it's worth it. It's worth exploring. And there's lots of people have Discord servers. If you're following anyone on Twitch, you will actually discover that a lot of people who regularly live stream on Twitch have their own Discord server or they share it with a group of other people who play the same games or do whatever it is that they are doing on Twitch. Um, people do crafting. People do um, metalworking and woodworking, glassworking. Um, there are people who are artists and they will do their artwork live on Twitch. There are people who cook. There are people who read books. Um, 
as well as the tons and tons and tons of people who actually do game. They play games on, on Twitch. Whatever computer game it is, it's their favourite, they will play it. And you can watch them all. You don't have to subscribe to be able to watch live things, usually anyway. And usually, depending on the settings that they've got, um, something is available for up to two weeks afterwards. And if there's somebody who's been partnered with Twitch, which means that they've got a lot of followers, a lot of followers and people who talk a lot more than we talk, um, then they can have theirs up for a lot longer. But that's okay, we don't need that because we save them all and we put them over on YouTube and then people, people watch them there. And you may be watching this over on YouTube, in which case you can go to my profile on YouTube, find my Twitch link and then go to Twitch. And I'm also on lots of other weird things online too, like Instagram and Twitter, as well as Facebook. But I don't usually put my Facebook link on there just because Facebook is weird. I still use it, but it's still weird, I think. Anyway, so what else? Is there anything else I need to tell you about? We shall be back in two days' time at three o'clock in New Zealand time, whatever that is for you. And if you're on Twitch, it will show you um, what time that should be in your time zone, what the time will be. I, I read Monday, Wednesday, Friday, New Zealand, three o'clock time zone, three days a week. There you go, usually for an hour, hour and a quarter, maybe an hour and a half. And if you come as soon as I start my um, live stream, I don't actually read immediately. I usually give about 10 minutes before I start reading. So I start at 10 minutes before 3 o'clock and start reading about 3 or at least talking at 3. Um, that way, if Twitch has decided it wants to show ads, you've got the ads out of the way before I start reading and you're not missing anything. There you go. Um, and if you've got stories that you want to catch up on, old-fashioned stories, or if you're not sure if you've done them or not, go over to my YouTube channel, have a search there, see what you can find. Rattle around in the, in the attic, find out what you can, have a bit of a listen or a watch, have a bit of a laugh. Some of them are quite, some of my chats are a little bit weird or funny, or there's lots of um, interesting information on there too. Um, because if I'm reading something which I know that the author understood so well and they believed that their audience, their readers, um, because they were from their own time period, would also understand because of the social setting, um, they won't necessarily explain it. And so therefore, because I possibly have a little bit more life experience than you, yeah, I'm old, believe it, um, Often I actually am already a lot more aware of some of these little factors. Not all of them, but a lot of them. Um, and also I grew up in a fairly old-fashioned family, fairly old-fashioned lifestyle, rural, New Zealand, old-fashioned. We used to go to museums sometimes for school and we'd look at things. Or when I was an adult, we'd go to museums and we'd see stuff in the museum. And I'd be thinking, why is this in the museum? It's just normal. It's stuff that's lying around in the shed at home. But here they've got it in a museum. I suppose somebody's got to start it in the museum sometime. But there are other people going, oh, what's that? I've never seen one of those before. You never know what you know that nobody else does, do you? There's an intriguing thought for you. Anyway, so how about we leave it there? It's been great having you here with me listening, enjoying your story, enjoying your drinks and snacks. Um, come, read, come prepared next time. Make sure you have water to keep you hydrated. And if you want something else to drink as well, bring that, something to snack on and have somewhere comfortable to sit. And we'll see you in two days' time with more, unless there's something else that comes up that means that urgently I can't actually read for you, in which case I usually try to change the schedule and, and put a little note on there which will be crossed out because it's a cancelled stream. But you'll see um, what that I'm not going to be reading if that happens I don't usually leave it unnotified anywho so there you go you've got some homework to do but it doesn't have a test at the end of the homework I won't be assessing you but if you discover some interesting things do come and share them over on our discord channel and I look forward to reading for you again next time in the meantime happy reading and thank you for being here bye